Okay, my name is uh, Jewel James. My Indian name is Sasiaf. Uh, from the Lummi Indian Nation. Uh, back in the 1980s, the, there was a, a group called the Alliance of American Indian Leaders that formed. Yeah, it was the late Roger Jourdain, late Wendell Chino, late Joe De La Cruz, late Sam Kagey, late Art Gabot, late Larry Kinley, late Kelsey Edmo. And I don't know if Richard Brielbird's alive or not, but I know uh, Dale Riesling and uh, Ron William Allen is, uh, Ron Allen is. Ron was the young tribal leader that came on board at that time, and I was just a staffer for Larry Kinley. And <clears throat> the Alliance uh, had uh, organized a meeting of themselves with the National Indian Health Board, and they brought Orrin Lyons in to teach us about Indians and the Constitution and the uh, uh, prophecy of the Iroquois Confederacy and how it influenced uh, America's form of po uh, uh, popular sovereignty. And uh, it was a real powerful uh, moment, and for me, uh, it, it became a life-changing moment. You know, and uh, Orrin said uh, uh, that when you pick up those teachings, that you become a wolf runner. And I took that to heart because uh, he brought in his elder and we planted a sacred tree, a tree, uh, tree of peace ceremony on the uh, mall. And so uh, that bound me spiritually to the teachings. And then later on, uh, Wendell, I mean, uh, Roger Jourdain, and he brought out a, a pipe. And he also had a ceremony, he bound us all to the teachings. And so we, we couldn't just walk away if we believed in the spirituality. And so I took it to heart. And uh, over the years, I used this uh, to battle for the uh, treaty rights exemption. It was the, one of the primary motivators I had on the Constitution and treaties made. And so it was the main argument that I'd use and lobby in the U.S. Congress. And we organized our campaign to get Indian fishing rights exemptions. And now it's, now it's law, 78-73 is the Indian fishing rights exemption. When we did that, we had the third most powerful man on the hill uh, uh, fighting us. He said there's no way that this, and he quoted, this chicken shed Indian language is going through. And uh, of course, Lummi burned boats and we kept, kept on going. And uh, we battled them and we won. Uh, later on, we did the interpretation so that all 16 sixteenths of the uh, uh, fishing rights pie is totally tax exempt. It's the only Indian resource uh, industry in the United States that's is so broadly interpreted that all parts of it is tax exempt and uh, the United States government and the state governments cannot tax any part of it. So that was a major victory and over the years, I, uh, based on Orrin's teachings on the Indians and the Constitution, I would uh, always hit the IRS wherever they'd go and I'd bring it up that you're in violation of the United States Constitution and I'd cite the laws, you know, um, uh, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, excluding Indians not taxed, Article 1, Section 8, uh, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, uh, Indian Commerce. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, including Indians not taxed. Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, Treaty Negotiation Powers. Article 3, Section 2, Clause 1, the courts can interpret the treaties made. Article 6, Clause 2, Treaties of Supreme Law of the Land. Article 6, Clause 3, all official, state and federal, are bound by those treaties of Supreme Law of the Land. On the uh, Fifth Amendment, when they amended the U.S. Constitution, they made sure that tribal Indians, now this is a real key distinction, tribal Indians cannot be represented, cannot be a member of we the people, and cannot be taxed. And so the uh, Reconstruction Congress uh, in the 1860s after the Civil War made sure that that language was, was in there. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment said, subject to the jurisdiction thereof. When they, asked, when, they, when they asked what that meant, it meant, if you want a relationship with an Indian tribe, you have to negotiate a treaty. If you want a commercial relationship, then it's uh, authorized under the Indian Commerce Clause. Other than that, Indians are outside the Constitution. And they, uh, the tribal Indians owe their allegiance to their tribe first and foremost. So John Elk, later on, 1884, uh, from Omaha Nation, test case, uh, took a test case on. They went all the way to Supreme Court. And they said, John Elk, you're a tribal Indian. You cannot be one of us under the United States Constitution. You owe your allegiance to your tribe. If we want relationships with you, we'll enter treaties or regulate commerce with you. And so uh, John Elk lost. He was classified as a tribal Indian. But during this time, um, from 1872 on, the United States uh, developed what they call the Religious Crimes Code. And so the Navajos, the Sioux, the Northwest Indians, all across the United States, Indians would go to jail for talking their language, doing a song, dance, or ceremony. And that, uh, that lasted until 1924, when a woman named Ida Mae Adams, a lawyer, uh, uh, took on the Indian rights and said, let's give them First Amendment under uh, religious freedom under the uh, U.S. Constitution. 
And so the United States enacted that uh, act in 24 on two reasons. One, uh, American Indian religious freedom under the First Amendment. Two, for in, in honor of the veterans that served in World War I. And so uh, from 1924 to 1978, we did not have religious freedom. And so we had to get the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. In 1988, the United States uh, struck it down so it doesn't protect any sacred sites or places. In the night, uh, we lost eagle feathers. We have got, uh, lost the right to peyote in the Native American church, which is over 10,000 years old. Prisoners lost the rights to rituals. Thanks to uh, 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 Reuben Snake and uh, Orrin Lyons and others that became a part of the uh, Religious Freedom Project, the 19, uh, in the 1990s, we got all those court cases overturned, and you got the American Indian Religious Freedom Act uh, uh, amended. Okay, but still, in 1956, the, uh, the tax court went, uh, took a case against the Quinaults, and uh, Capoleman won in to defend his rights. Now, during this time, the tribes couldn't defend him. They weren't allowed in the court. It was between the United States and a citizen Indian. They said, you made a citizen in 1924. So it's between us and a citizen. It has nothing to do with tribal rights. And so they kept the tribes out. We were so busy fighting termination, trying to stop relocation, trying to stop them from uh, sending in uh, uh, states under Public Law 280 that we, we didn't have the effort, we didn't have the authority to hire our own lawyers and to be in a tax court and to defend our people. BIA controlled everything and were considered incompetent. And so tribes were set up for the loss in 1956, but Kapoman defended one sixteenth of the industry, uh, the rights of his own, uh, because he owned the timber on trust land, he got trust uh, income. But all 15 sixteenths of the rest of the industry became taxable. Now the court said in ordinary affairs, Indians are citizens. And so we have to, what are, we never got that defined. Just, the IRS just came in and said, all you Indians are citizens. And they never distinguished between an ordinary affairs versus tribal Indian or an allegiance to your tribal nation, doing tribal activities within your Indian, Indian country. And so it's been a battle because the IRS goes after individuals. And usually they can't afford to pay the taxes, the penalties, or the interest, or the fines. And so they settle. And so it's a lot of cheap victory that has built up the precedence. Now, part of our problem was that uh, uh, in, in Orrin Lyons' teachings, uh, these are the parts of the Constitution that stops them from having jurisdiction over Indian tribes. If they live by the Constitution, and then uh, these cases up on top that support tribal government and treaty rights, government to government relationships, these cases, they're not uh, that clear, but they support sovereignty, okay, and not as uh, clear as if it was our inherent sovereignty, our traditional inherent sovereignty, but this is a sovereignty that's interpreted through white eyes, white law, white judges, and so they're recognizing some of it, okay, down here, these are the cases that say Indians are incompetent, non-competent, and we can do as we uh, please, basically they're saying there are no rights the Indians have that we have to respect, and so this undermines not only our government, but our status as tribal Indians. And so uh, on this side here, where it says treaties interpreted as we understood them, ambiguities resolved in our favor, absent changes by treaty or statute, then Indian sovereignty is intact. Down here, the basic tenet is U.S. guardianship over nations and individual Indians as wards. And so the... In Johnson B. McIntosh, I know Oren and uh, many others have gone across the United States, Tom up in Canada, and talking against the Discovery Doctrine. The Discovery Doctrine was a, 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 a way that discovering European nations who discovered our, our land and discovered us, the first Christian nation to discover us had uh, first claim to the territory. And, but they're, they're really the only claim they had was to establish relationships with us. But then the, uh, uh, the Catholic Church is all, oh, unless they're infidels, pagans, heathens, atheists, and then you have the obligation to conquer them. And so uh, under that, uh, those, uh, those papal bulls, papal bulls, the, the, uh, court, the, the uh, Pope was supporting these uh, Christian nations. Now this is during the time of Reformation as well, so while discovery is going on, they're competing amongst uh, countries in regards to how to reform the uh, churches so that not everybody's a Catholic, but they're still Christians. And but we're considered as non-Christian. 
Now, in Johnson B. McIntosh, uh, what was going on here is way before 1823, almost 70 years earlier, not a uh, colonialist came into Indian country and he said, one, buy your land. And so King George says on the proclamation of King George, stay out of Indian country. Only I can establish relationships. And so that case went on and it got developed. It was a rigged case of basically the same party on both sides suing itself. But Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall, took the case. Him and his dad had applied for 258,000 acres inside Indian country. And it just so happens, by coincidence, the decision he made guaranteed him and his dad got all that land. Okay? And he did feel bad, so he said in Worcester, the state of Georgia has to stay out of uh, Cherokee territory. But later on, he would say Indians are dependent domestic sovereigns, like wards to the guardian. And so he structured this schizophrenia. This is, uh, uh, there's two personalities in Indian country. And if, if they were uh, not schizophrenic, and then the U.S. Constitution would keep them out just as Orrin has taught us in 1986. It would limit their uh, uh, jurisdiction inside our boundaries, and they would regulate commerce with us. If they wanted to change our relationship, it would have to be by treaty. And so uh, 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 without that schizophrenia, these cases would have been more strong pro-sovereign. And so what I recognize based on Warren's teaching is that most lawyers are defending any country don't know. They don't know the original relationship, and that is still alive under the Constitution. It's still valid under the Constitution. It's never been amended to stop the, or change this check and balance system that was written in. And thank God for the Iroquois uh, Confederacy. And later they added the Choctaw Confederacies that there were in, major influences on the evolution of popular sovereignty. And so uh, you're, you're, I'm really happy as a wolf runner to be able to finally report to you because it's been um, uh, 86, 96, 2006, uh, 30, 32 years that you put me on this journey. And uh, with those uh, ceremonies between you, uh, your, your elder and uh, Roger Jourdain, I was tied to this truth, this truth, advocate this truth in all the battles. And so Walter Echohawk uh, wrote a book on In the Courts of the Conqueror. And it, I thought, darn, Walter, that's a good book. I'll read it again. So I wrote, read it again. And I thought, why didn't you map it out, Walter? And I go, why don't I map, map it out? You know, so, <laughs> and so I mapped this out. And uh, so far, uh, where we presented it, the idea was that eventually this would be a computerized system for all tribal leaders to be able to track these teachings versus these teachings and to know the difference. And so, uh, uh, Due to budget constraints, I wasn't able to get out there, but I know Niga would uh, be willing to, Ernie Stevens said, we'll, we'll raise all the funds for it. You know, John Echohawk and Arf says, we need this. We want to be a party to it. And so the basic idea is to uh, hand it off to John, see if they want to take it further. But the thing about this whole campaign is that uh, now we're uh, dealing with taxation. And so I know most leaders don't understand that. Excluding India is not tax, like you taught us, is still valid law. It's still a part of the 14th Amendment, and the 1924 Act does not amend the U.S. Constitution. And so we are still tribal Indians. They said, what are, what are excluding Indians not to have? Those are the tribal Indians. They are outside of our jurisdiction. We do not have dominion or jurisdiction over them. And so we still exist, but in 1940, a solicitor issued an opinion, and he, left, he tracked all this information. It looked like he's going to say, Indians, the Indians are right. They're separate from us. It looked like it. He put all that evidence in there, and then he said, but you made them citizens, so there no longer exist any tribal Indians. So by a stroke of a pen, all tribal Indians across the nation disappeared politically and legally. And so we became these incompetent, taxable citizen Indians. And so my argument is, is that um, uh, in ordinary affairs, that's, that's one where uh, if we're going to be a U.S. citizen under this 24 Act, in ordinary affairs, when we're out there living with them, walking with them, talking with them, worshiping with them, uh, doing everything like them, voting for their government, and then that's in ordinary affairs. But when we come home, our allegiance is to our people, and our tribal nation governs over us and protects us. That's tribal Indian. That's what the tribal Indian expects. That's under the sovereignty of the Indian nation. And so over the years, we have battled for these different definitions of what is not taxable. This stuff down here is the tribal Indian rights. You can't touch this. And we're slowly expanding it over time. As a tribal Indian, we have rights under the uh, 
Indian Self-Determination Act, the uh, Self-Government Act amendments, uh, the American Indian Great Protection Repatriation Act, American Indian Religious Freedom Act, uh, the American Indian Arts and Crafts Act, all these different laws that are enacted are specific to tribal Indians. Only tribal Indians can do that. You can't be a citizen and do this. This is limited to Indian country. And so uh, if you're a non-Indian trying to do this, you're going to get sued and you're going to get stopped and you're going to get driven out of Indian country. And so, especially like uh, the American Indian Arts and Crafts Act that we just got amended uh, a few years ago. This, the, above this line is uh, the areas that we say in ordinary affairs, Indians are citizens. And so if you're out here uh, in the city, Seattle or San Francisco or Chicago or New York, and then yeah, you could be out there as a taxable Indian. But our challenge is to um, differentiate uh, between um, uh, in ordinary affairs, Indian citizenship, tribal Indian status, and ceremonial activities. If we ever get, uh, we, uh, the test case I set up by fighting for uh, the, ex ex uh, the exclusion of all Indian totem pole art, all Indian art is tax exempt, well, I just won this week. The idea was to create enough ambiguity in the IRS's understanding that it may have to go back to Congress. And then that's where we, that's where we come in. And then when we get the definitions that we need on what is a tribal Indian like John Elk, the court already uh, defined it in 1884, and it's still a standing case. And um, what are Indian citizens? And what are, uh, uh, in regards to their duties to the state or federal government? And what are tribal Indians in regards to their duties to uh, tribal governments? And what are ceremonial activities? Well. In my presentation uh, that I, I handed you the literature on uh, what we, I hope becomes the booklet on ceremonial activities, it's all of this, all of this. Wherever our traditional knowledge and our traditional song, dance, and ceremonies, all of that handed down from generation to generation are ceremonial activities because we're, we're reciting to our children how to live in a way with the world around us that was taught to us by our ancestors. And so, uh, even though we wanted to, uh, my case uh, became an example, they already ordered uh, the Seattle office to stop auditing Indian artists. It's under ceremonial activity. And so that's, that's in place now, and they're processing the paperwork, but it's not national yet. Our goal is to get them to the table and to keep fighting based on this, pre these, uh, this relationship, the tr uh, constitutional relationship, the treaty relationship, the government to government relationship, we demand consultation. Like, we, uh, like in the uh, uh, United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, free and prior informed consent. And so we got to exercise that uh, and demand the consultations. And some are saying, oh, it's too late. You should have done that in 2015. You know, hey, we resisted for 500 years and we're going to be here for another 500 years resisting. Whatever it takes. You know, and uh, if we uh, are successful, then hopefully uh, we'll undermine the foundations of Squire versus Capullman where they've got to step back and say, oh wait, the court said in ordinary affairs. And we should have limited it to things outside of Indian country. And so uh, Rudy Reeser said in 1986 in front of the House hearings uh, dealing with the Arizona's Republic's uh, news article that the BIA was stealing everything, which Cobell proved. Well, Rudy testified that uh, you, you uh, appropriate a billion dollars for Indian country for Indian Affairs, but you take out four billion in taxes. Okay, they take out four times more than they get, uh, allocate. You know, so the other things that are down here, of course, is Indian health, uh, treaty rights, uh, and uh, housing and stuff. And so you, those are exercised as tribal Indians within our Indian country. And so the whole plan is to keep being uh, a wolf runner for you. Uh, here at Lummi, they don't know I became a runner uh, for your nation, that you gave me that. And um, I think in all, uh, one thing I can say is that it guided me in everything we've done uh, on this side. I kept it alive. So this, this was my opportunity to finally report to you and let you know that I heard you and I put it right here. And I'll keep it there. And thank you for being who you are because uh, I remember uh, you and... Um, uh, the, the chairwoman of Geronimo's people. Uh, she was chairwoman of Geronimo's uh, Apaches. Um, uh, 
I forget her name right now. Hard for me though. Yeah, but she was born in captivity. And between the two of you, uh, we heard the message of survival. And so the alliance is gone, but uh, I think their message is alive. And we do have the standing resolutions, uh, House Senate Concurrent Resolution 76 and House Concurrent Resolution 331 that said America's form of constitutional government is based on the teachings of the Iroquois and Choctaw Confederacies. And the relationship is by treaty and government to government. And so thank you for being a teacher. Well, it's amazing what you've done. It's amazing. You're a very analytical mind, and that's what you have to deal with. Them. And uh, I would say this is the, uh, what you've laid out here is a history. And uh, we haven't really fought the fight yet. I mean, it's been in and out of course now, but little by little, we've been backing them up because of this kind of work. And um, <coughs> the battle for sovereignty is coming. It's not, not this would be the groundwork of it. Yeah. But it's coming. So it's up to the people to, to do it. I mean, uh, you know, you can talk about law and so forth, but if the people don't back it up and don't get in the fight, then you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So the foundation is uh, build that spirit in the people to, to battle. They're going to take things away. You know, that's how they'll deal with it. But you have to get past that and stay, stay the course, you know. Yep. And um, I would say the next 10 years for global warming is going to make a lot of definitions no matter who you are, no matter what your law is, no matter. Yeah. It's going to bring a common survival, and they may have to go back to our values to survive. Yeah. And so we're, we're it's not over at all. But this kind of work is really important, very important. So we, you've got it laid out, and we have to put that in, a, in some kind of a, a context that we can refer to, and they can refer to, because you're dealing with them on their, their level of law, yeah. but with the principle in the back behind it, that's, that's the strength back there. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about the doctrine of discovery later on, which will give you a further base Great. to work from. All right. uh, that's where it's at, right, right. there. Yeah. And they're, they're caught there, they're caught. Yep. But you have to bring it through up to that, um, that court case that you start with there. But uh, just before that, and, uh, and yeah. what he refers to in that court case, yeah, it is uh, is where they're weak, and uh, taking us a long time to get that foreknowledge. So the doctrine of discovery is an amazing uh, takeover of whole Western Hemisphere, you know, by declaration by fiat. You know, they say, okay, this is all mine now. And um, people living here had no idea what they're talking about, but and then the battle began of, all right, this is how we're going to do it. But in that declaration of uh, this is all mine now, they made a mistake, or they didn't understand. And they said that the Indian nations have a right of occupancy. Same right as a rabbit or a deer <laughs> running in the woods. Of, well, the Indians are there, but they're like that. But it's a legal perspective. And they said that they always have that right. But in for, order for you to actually take their land, they have to give up that right. And it's not by declaration, not by these laws, because we haven't given that up yet. It's, and so uh, they need the consent yeah. of the people before they can actually tell you, because that's in their, that's the mistake that's in the doctrine of discovery. 
But they were, you know, in those years, they, they were just taping anything, whatever they were doing, and they were thinking it's going to come to this point. But they, within their own position, within the position they took, they are weak. Yep. Remember that. I know uh, John Marshall said in that map of God case, we know it's all based on a lie. But if we admit it's a lie, then we have to give it all back. <laughs> and we can't do that. Yeah. So we have to act as if the lie is true. Exactly. All right. Okay. Yeah. Heishka. Move over here now, you guys.
This one here, excuse the show. <laughs> That's what it's all about. <laughs> You're a good one. Asiya, Nishkala Chasiya, Eta Salalu, Eta Siaflam, Outsen Pachi Saflamichasen, E Utatasen Punas Puna, This Glee Puna Squal, the Coquina Squal, the Tia Squal, Hajka Kunas in a Tacho, Eta Yats and Clutzatin Aquaria. That's a siam, a stalicha siam, sweet and pohilok, quenas langnuch, he and a stalicha. Dear friends, relatives, elders, and respected women, I don't know the Lummi language, but I'm still learning. On behalf of our family, on behalf of the nation, thanking each and every one of you for being here. And our hands go up to each and every one of you. We're very happy to see you, our friends and relatives. I squile, Miss Jalicha Siam, Tony Hilaird Sinnet Snat, Satsenton Sinnet Snat, Chuck Lummison. Uh, good day, my dear friends and relatives. My name is Tony Hilaire. My name is Satsenton. I come from Lummi. I'd like to thank you all for being here today. A uh, special thank you to uh, Councilman Solomon, uh, Secretary of the Lummi Indian Business Council and the Blackhawk Singers. Thank you for sharing that song. Uh, thank you to all the past tribal leaders that are, that are here. Some of them already left, but uh, also thank you to the, um, the, the people that are here running through local office. I see Seth Fleetwood here and April Parker uh, Heishka for being here today. Uh, also special thanks to Orlines uh, for traveling to be here um, from the, the Seneca Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, a longtime uh, lacrosse <coughs> player and well-renowned uh, advocate for indigenous rights. Uh, thank you for, for being here. Uh, we're hosted today by the Lummi Indian Business Council and the Children of the Setting Sun Productions to have a conversation on climate change um, with Chairman Jay Julius, uh, Orrin Lyons, uh, Tom Sampson, Jewel James, and Jill Witt. In 2007, uh, Orrin Lyons uh, spoke to the United Nations and he said, he quoted uh, a man, and I'm sorry if I got his name wrong, um, Akio Matsumura, that value change for survival. If we don't change our values, uh, we won't survive. And in response to that advice, uh, we're here to have a conversation with these five to discuss the urgent need in our community, uh, the challenges that we face, and everything that we need to do to, to, to change our, our perceptions, to change our values for the betterment, betterment of all humankind, as well as Mother Earth. So I think we'll start off with um, Chairman Julius uh, to uh, respond to that advice, and then uh, we'll just go down the line and mainly have more of a conversation than just a <coughs> Uh, one question and then they each answer and then uh, we'll, I think we'll open it up for, for questions after that. Heishka. Mm -hmm. Heishka, Tony, <coughs> Daryl, uh, all those who helped uh, put this together, those who are here to, to witness. Um, thank you to Jewel and Tom and Jill for all of your work and the value you bring 
each in, in, in your own way. And uh, the example you guys have led by, um, the work you've done in the past to pave the way for these young ones, myself um, and, and many others to, you've guided us and, and shown us by example uh, how to continue on this necessary work. Uh, Oren, it's an honor and a privilege to be sitting here today. Thank you for coming to Lummi Nation's homeland. Mm. Um, I know there's a history here uh, with yourself and past leaders, Sam Kagey, Vernon Lane was my grandfather, yeah. and many others, Willie Jones and um, Henry Kagey, and the list goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just very honored and privileged to be here and uh, to share a few um, ideas and thoughts and really listen um, and learn and uh, uh, love, love. I'm excited to grab onto the takeaways um, mm -hmm. that I'm going to get from you and uh, the youth are going to get from, from each and every one of you. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Lummi Nation is facing many climate change challenges, uh, policies by policymakers from the past. We're living in the uh, reality of those bad decisions that were made in the past that got us to where we are today. Um, really made it a focus to not point fingers and point blame <clears throat> because we don't have time. I'm of the belief, uh, I quote Governor Inslee in Years of Living Dangerously, he said, we are the first generation to feel the impacts of climate change, but we're the last generation who could do anything about it. And I really take that to heart. Uh, I personally was born a fisherman, put on the water and on a boat at a very, very, very young age. Um, so just for myself, in the last 44 years, I've seen um, major change on the water, the river systems, the Salish Sea, the salmon, the herring, the orcas, um, and everything that is uh, important to us as native people. Because for us here on the west, northwest, 164 years ago is when we entered into our treaty in 1855. And in 1855, we often share, and when we have an opportunity to share with uh, groups of people, whether it's a small group like this or uh, Beth Brownfield inviting me to Portland to speak in front of 5,000 people, um, no matter the amount or who it is and what audience is, or Jill inviting me to speak with on the stage with Al Gore and um, Governor Inslee, um, no matter who the audience is, uh, it's a short period of time. My great grandma, I walked this earth with and held her hand and she was born in 1892. Mm -hmm. And uh, she died when I was five in 1980. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really resonates with outsiders is I was one, hand, I was one hug away, I was one handshake away from mm -hmm. pre-contact. But they were raised and I was raised by individuals who grew up with individuals who were here before there was contact. It wasn't that long ago. And, w and the challenge I've found that we see all across Indian country is how do you create empathy? How do you create empathy and understanding when we take our values and we live out our values even today, you witness today our culture and the importance of keeping that strong. How do you create empathy when the values of a country that we are a sovereign within are different and not in line with who we are still today and who we've always been for, uh, since time immemorial. Um, we were great stewards of this land and for us in particular, we're big on salmon. We're big on water, Salish Sea, the river systems, the streams, telling the story of what it once was. When the, when the, uh, in 1855, when the treaty was signed, you can walk across the backs of salmon on every river. Uh, you look out into the Salish Sea and all you see is this. And you look at testimony from 1927 and the land claims, they, the natives back then talk about um, this is all you would see. And it was as far down and deep as you could see with the eye. That's how rich this place was, this garden. And one thing I found interesting is tapping in to policymakers on the outside that we are partners with, that we are neighbors with, one thing um, that has really resonated is our beliefs. We all have a belief. 
most of us. Indigenous people believe in the Creator, we have a higher power, and those who are citizens of the United States or the United States itself, you look on every piece of money, it says in God we trust. And uh, I don't know what the exact percentages it are, but faith has somehow or ha has been a way to create that empathy, I have found. And one of the questions uh, that I pose to others when fighting to protect our sacred lands, our burial grounds, our treaty protected areas, our sailor sea, when it's hard to create buy-in and when jobs <clears throat> versus burial grounds of Indians is you know, outweighed over here because of their values and economic development and things like that. Um, and what we've witnessed over the last hundred, you know, couple of centuries. Um, I pose the question to a Christian, is the Jordan River sacred? If so, why? And what would you be willing to do way over here in this country were there proposed development and a proposal to dry up that river? There would be an uproar, even here in this country. Why? And then I pose the question, the water that Jesus was baptized in is long gone. It flowed into the Dead Sea. What makes it sacred? Why does it mean that much to our faith? And trying to create that empathy because it's not, it, it's going to take a, a, a team, it's going to take a movement, it's going to take these youth working together with outside communities to really instill value change in this entire country, on this entire planet. And um, that's one thing I've found. And I just wanted to share that quickly because I, in my eight short years of uh, being elected to leadership on council, we faced gigantic battles against the largest coal port proposal in North America proposed on our sacred lands, on our village site, and impacting our treaty rights. The breeding of invasive species in our waters, and then the collapse of that, those net pins, and then these invasive species going into our river systems while the salmon are uh, running and trying to make it home. Um, habitat, <coughs> culverts, um, you know, we just won a uh, Supreme Court case on culverts with Washington. So I just um, wanted to touch on that, but I'm really here to, to listen and uh, share some thoughts. When I heard value change, um, uh, when it comes to climate change, I think um, we're putting in that work. I, I see it all throughout um, Indian country and, and all throughout, I, I see it in many places, this desire to create change. And I think it starts on the outside. A lot of it is policymakers and acknowledging what policies got us to where we are today and the justification for these policies that destroyed and capped off rivers, uh, dried up rivers, um, consumption of water, pollution, fish consumption rates. The list goes on and on and on. How did we get here? But more importantly, policymakers making these decisions for us today looking seven generations ahead, how do we create that change? And I want to thank you for all of your work, each and every one of you, because I've taken a piece of each and every one of you, and I really value your leadership, your philosophies, your theories, your, uh, your will, your courage, and uh, I, I just thank each and every one of you for being here. Thank each and every one of you uh, in, the, in the audience here for being here. And I look forward to this conversation. Heishka. Asiyam nishchila chut. Lesson ku chow chay se tia e niku. Snes te chot te shwak wata. Lilk se ne, shuneng se ne shtang. Skwara se te tlingel. Nilku tia nis chay se te. Kwel lak se ne, jalamuk te sil the <laughs> Nilkos chile esle ne swako, 
Nu så att jag älskar att jag inte tittar på det jag är nu. Det är en kväll jag inte älskar att hålla mig. Jag har inte tittat på det jag älskar att jag är. Jag har smålat och sen skväll. Jag har smålat och sen kjellingen. Jag har lyst til at så lave os, så skal vi også en gang gå ned. Aarhus kunne jeg malak, og så kunne jeg ikke tænke. Hvor angler, så skal jeg løg, så kan jeg ikke lade, så kan jeg ikke lade mig klæde. Hvor angler, så skal jeg løg. Det er hvert fald, så det snigger, eller at jeg er enig. Hæg skal jeg, og kan jeg ikke lade, og kan jeg ikke lade. Ik zijn snepanak, alles malak. Niet goed zijn is je eisen ze, kwel, ik zeg gewoon niks te squeezelte. I first of all want to thank the Lummi people for organizing this gathering. I was told many years ago when you're grateful to someone that we must stand up. And I'm grateful to this man I've known for a while. It is said by our teaching, there will be a person who will come from where the sun rises and he's gonna bring a message to us. He's gonna tell us things that they have experienced because they were the first ones to come in contact what do we call the Chalunguk, the first foreigners. And as we listen to these people who came to us, listen to the message about their experience and the lessons learned from where my friend comes from. My great, my granddaughter married into a Mohawk some 16 years ago. It comes from Akwasasne and she comes home every so often and talks to us about what they do. But today we gather together to share our experience and the knowledge that comes from ancient time. There are so many things that we have to say so that our children and the children not born yet have to know. It is not an easy time for all of us. I speak on a show in Victoria called Indigenous Voices. And I talk about the environment that my friend talks about. We said, you know, we, the word environment talks about the land and what it is. And I always say to them, the first citizens of this land were not human beings. We were the last to be created, and we're not very good caretakers. My great-grandmother used to sit outside in the fall or in the summertime, and she'd talk to me at nighttime. The moon, look at it, grandson. The moon is tipping the sockeye into the ocean. Remember this moon. Don't forget it. And she told me too, you see this tree over here, it's winter time now. Look at it, it's got its winter coat on. And I used to ask my great grandma, how do you know it's this coat? Well, it's called the moss that grows on a tree. It's real thick. And when the moss is like that, it's gonna be a cold winter. All of our people knew these things. They learned to listen to the tree. They learned to listen to the moon. They learned to the messengers that the sun brings to us each day. Humans are the worst predators in the world. We have no boundaries. We tend to believe that if we make something new, it's gonna be better tomorrow. When I listen to that kind of talk, and I speak at several universities, talking to young people, some of them are a fourth degree, 
lawyers, they're going to be law people. And they asked me, how do you know these things? I said, it's because I have a language. I listened to my great grandma. She's the one that told me. My great grandmother was 125 when she died. And I lived with her the first seven years of my life. And I never spoke English till I went to school. And then I began to learn another language. But it's the experience of, of my friend here that talks so many times across the country and in other countries that we're grateful or that you bring these messages not only here in North America, but across the world. Because the world has got to listen to us. We are the last place on earth. There's still a chance to save this planet. But if we don't listen to our history, to the history of this land, our children will have nothing to celebrate. The celebration of the coming of the salmon, the celebration of the first child born, these are going to disappear because we have not learned to listen. I listened to my great grandma, my young friend here, talk about empathy. She used to cry when she talked to me. I want you to listen to me when I'm crying. And sometimes when she was crying, she'd sing the song, the song of sadness, because maybe she knew what my future was going to be, the struggle that we face today. But we learned those songs. Every song belongs to somebody or something, whether it's the wolf, or the bear, the clam, the oyster, the crab, everything. They have their own songs, and they, we don't know what they are. The trees tells us about the weather. The tree of a woman, she's a widow woman. She tells us about the coming of the wind, and she whispers to us. It's these kind of teachings that have gone, are not being talked about in the schools anymore. We talk about history, we talk about the environment, we forecast even tomorrow. For me, I'm just grateful to wake up in the morning and I say thank you, because it's only this day that I can celebrate and be grateful not only for each other and grateful to my friend that's here and to the young leaders that are coming up. We have to learn to walk carefully, and we have to learn to listen. In early winter, our people go back to the longhouse, and they sing their songs. A lot of people just say, well, they're just dan they're Indian dancing. They're not. They're bringing back the history of who we are, the songs of the bear, the songs of the wolf, the songs of the salmon, the songs of the killer whale. These are all songs that we know. Today's people have not learned that yet. They, cre they create values that are far beyond our ability to, to manage with them. Their talent is something we have to deal with. When I speak in, in Victoria, on indigenous voices. I say the corporate world really runs this country. They are the government. It is not who gets elected. It is the prime minister, the presidents, and all the people who get elected in North America. They are not the leaders. The real leader is the guy who owns the money and the guy who can pay the people to do his job. We have to understand the corporate world. The corporate world can be useful if we have a say in how they do things. And we see that in Canada right now regarding the Kinder Morgan pipeline. 
the prime minister of that country promised us, we will listen to you and we will carefully make our own assessment based on your information. They haven't done that. So we learn our lesson then about who owns this country called North America. It is not those of you who vote. Your vote don't mean a heck of a lot when it comes to the value of the corporate world. And I tell that to the politicians in British Columbia. You better listen to your constituency. If you don't hear what they're saying, you have no business representing them. I'm not a very popular person when it comes to talking about politics, because I, I got out of it in 1983. I was chief of my village for 25 years, and I woke up one day and I said, that's it, no more. I will not be a messenger for the government, and I quit. I had no idea what I was going to do. My wife asked me, where are you going to work? I said, I don't know. What about the kids? I don't know. We're just going to have to work hard. And we did. So, Orrin, I want to thank you for the, the words that you've brought, not only here, but across the con continent and other countries. You've been the voice from the east, from where the sun rises, they say. And that voice has been good for us. You've cautioned us, like many other leaders have cautioned us. I'm half Nespers. My mother was a Nespers woman. And her families went to war in this country. And one of the stories that I read from their history, when the Nespers were at war, and some of the Nespers and other tribes joined the army to fight against the Nespers. And they said, we were sad when we saw our brothers on the other side fighting against us. And that again is another lesson. Sometimes our people cross the line mm -hmm. and they become part of the problem that we are striving to protect Mother Earth. So as we train our young leaders, we have to make sure they understand the values, the culture, the history, to make sure they understand what it is. The tiniest little ant is important to us. The serpent that crawls on the ground, they are messengers too. All of these things meant something to us. And maybe, Orrin, you didn't know you were talking about us, but you were in your talk across the country. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Coast Salish people and those of us who live, what we call the Seisu Ostelmuch, the people who live at the edge of the water. I want to thank you for the words and the messages that you've brought, not only in this continent, but across the world. Hmm. Now, what has scanned up? I said from our language, thank you for being well. That's our greeting. Scano, same word for peace. Now, what has scanned up? And in our language, your answer is, Kwasha Dogus. What you say is true. It's, uh, <clears throat> I was so pleased to come to uh, Lummi country again. And it's been on my mind for a long time. Um, first, I want to introduce myself. My name is Joy Quishon. Tahuni, not dang, I'm Wolf Clan. And my mother was Wolf, Seneca Nation. My father was an eel on a dog nation. And to clarify the introduction, 
in the Haudenosaunee, we are matrilineal. We go by the mother's side for our identity. And when my mother came to Onondaga as a young lady, and my father married her and they raised a family. Six boys and one girl. Uh, I was brought up at Onondaga. That's where I live. But I was Seneca by my mother's side. All our family, six boys and one girl, Seneca. And then they asked me to sit on the uh, Onondaga Council, and my youngest brother, Kingsley Lyons. And we were quite young at the time. And she said to the clan mother, Rita Peters, she was holding five titles because there were four other clan mothers that were MIA somewhere. So she had these titles. She had to fill them titles. And we have a process within the Haudenosaunee, what people call Six Nation. Uh, French call us Iroquois. English call us Six Nations and our proper name, Haudenosaunee. That's Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, Tuscarora. That's our confederation, the old. And we have adoption policies in our confederation. And so part of the process of becoming on a chief's council leaders council have to be on a daga so I I had to consider as my younger brother we would have to go and we would have to take our name off the Seneca nation and be adopted into the Onondaga nation it's a long process and you can't do one without the other. So I asked my youngest brother, and I said, uh, Rita says, you should come along with me. And he was pretty wild, and I was pretty wild myself. But he said, he said, well, what do you think? I said, I don't, I don't know. She's, she wants you to come with me. Okay, so we went to the leadership of the Seneca Nation, Cattaraugus, New York, and we told them what our ideas were and our position that we had to remove ourselves now from, from the role of Seneca people. They were reluctant to let us go, but I said, well, they said, you understand what, uh, what that means? I said, you know, your, your land or you don't have any, yes, I said, we understand all that. So I said, oh, all right. And so we were taken off the rolls of the Seneca Nation. And then We didn't belong anywhere. And it took almost five years before they adopted us. So we were kind of in no man's land for five years. But then we were adopted. And the clan mother said, you have a choice here. You can be adopted into the clan that I want you to sit for, which was the turtle. I said, do I have an option? She says, yes, you do. She says, if you want to keep your clan, 
And then the position that you sit for in a turtle will be temporary until we find somebody that's from the turtle to take your place. She says, but it's, yes, you can maintain your identity as a wolf. And I did. As well as my youngest brother. So we were temporary. That was 55 years ago. <laughs> 55 years now on that council, temporary. <laughs> it's hard to find leaders, very, very hard to find leaders that's willing to commit. Now, our system at Onondaga, on the Haudenosaunee, is still the old system. It's still the traditional system that was established probably 1,400, 1,500 years ago. There's no elective system at Onondaga. There's no BIA. There is no government but us. Because of that, because we keep our way. It's not easy. And so I wanted to clarify the introduction because he introduced me as a Seneca. I'm Onondaga, wolf. We have, um, on one side of uh, our, our council at Onondaga, we have the beaver clan, uh, snipe clan, that little bird and long, snipe clan, turtle clan, a wolf clan that sits on this side of the house. And on the other side of the house, uh, we work across is a deer clan, a bear clan, and the eel clan, and the uh, hawk clan. And in the Seneca Nation, they have the same clans, but they had one more, and they have the uh, heron clan. And the different nations, the Mohawk Nation has three clans, turtle, wolf, bear. And uh, Cayugas have six and so forth. So it's not all the same across, but the, the clans are the same. And then what I found out over period of time was that a wolf is a wolf is a wolf, whether I'm in New York or whether I'm in Arizona, there's a wolf clan, so that's my family. I know you have a wolf clan, my family, we're all one. So it's a broad family, the way we do. And what I found out, I learned over a period of time was how our system, the clan system, tied us to the earth. A brilliant, brilliant system. Because we're tied to the earth. A wolf is my brother. I look after him. I worry about him. I think about him. His work. And the same with all. And when I traveled around, I found out that Navajo Nation, my goodness, they had a cloud clan, they had a wind clan, they had <laughs> but all tied to the earth. It's brilliant. So we're relatives out there. Everything you see out there is our relatives. And close, close related. And I listen to the Lakotas in their prayers at the end, they always say, all my relations. And when they say all my relations, they mean every fish that's swimming, every tree that's growing, every grass. That's our family. That's your family. It's our family. 
But our brother from across the sea, he's lost that relationship. Doesn't understand it, knows it's there, but lost it. And that kind of give him license to take advantage and do things that's to your own relative that you shouldn't do. In the Confederacy so long ago, when they put us all together, the peacemaker, the great peacemaker, gathered us long ago. It's a long story. I won't go into that because it's so long, but established our relationships and the clans. What he said to the leaders at that time, go into the woods and the first thing you see, come back and tell me. I saw a beaver, henceforth, that's your family. I saw a snipe, henceforth, that's your family. So he established that to us. And that's matrilineal, the women our lines run with the women. Whoever the mother is, that's who you are, not the father, the mother. And as you well know, the mothers think different than the men. They're concerned about life, and they're concerned about family, and they're concerned about things. And the men, they have other ideas sometimes, and they have other work as well. So there's always a balance, there's always a balance. But it takes a man and a woman to make a family, children. However, to look after children. And so the work is equal, as you know. But over all the years of my travel and so forth, I see the women work harder than the men. There's no doubt about that. They work harder than the men. And they kind of overlook our sometimes not growing up fast enough. Mm -hmm. They kind of, you know, they, they have a lot of patience with us, luckily, fortunate for us. And so it's been a, 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 good, a good relationship, a good family. It's a good balance, look after responsibility of the earth here. That's our responsibility. And the two common laws that I see in my travels, I see that uh, our people, and I say our people, I'm talking about native people in these lands here. They have two common law, two rules. And the first law, the first rule is respect. Respect for yourself, respect for the nation, respect for life, respect for everything. That's a law, that's a rule. The second one is to share. Share what you have. Everything. If there's. That's a big law, that's a big rule to share. In the old days, a hunter would go out in the woods and he would find his mark and leave meat hanging in a tree for next person that comes through. He's sharing. And the youngest hunter, the first time, the first kill, he takes that meat and he goes to all the elders and he gives it to them. That's his first rule, the first law, to share. And that's what our brother from across the water doesn't like. He's the opposite way. Mine, he says, me. It's hard for us to fight that, but we've managed to, to do that. Just uh, two days ago, I was down to uh, Yelm, where we had a traditional circle of Indian elders and youth meeting. It's our annual meeting, and we 
bring in the traditional leaders from all over the country. And we were hosted by a nation. This was Nisqualis was hosting us. And the McLeod family. And we'll, next year we're going to be hosted by the uh, Northern Cheyenne Lame Deer. They have taken the staff, so that's where we'll be meeting next year. And to re-energize the nation and the people back to their traditions. I was very pleased to see the dancers and the songs here. It really raised my spirits to see that little, little boy. Boy, he was dancing. That's the future now. Sometime, not too long, he's going to be this big. He's going to take care of them. But he's got a good start. And that's to your credit that you keep those songs and you keep those dances. That's the foundation of us. That's our foundation. This is a ceremony. That's who we are. To give thanks. So the two rules to be thankful, to share, make sure, and respect. Respect for life, respect for everything, and above all, respect for yourself. Today's times, I've watched this change over a period of time. My elder brother here, we've seen a lot of changes. You know, I grew up early on at Onondaga when there was just one car there. The rest was all horse and wagon. I grew up in that horse and wagon. I could harness a horse. I could, uh, I could set up a wagon. I knew how to do that because you had to. That's what it was. And we raised all our own food. Everything, we grew everything, basically. I grew up in a kind of, this is in New York, central New York. Yeah. And I think I was four years old the first time I saw a white man. There was four of us. We were playing along the road in the bushes, and here comes a, a rag man. He's, he's got a wagon and a horse, and he's a white man selling rags. And ooh, you scary to us. We were hiding in the bushes and we watched him go by, you know. <laughs> but he was an old man and he had a white beard and he had a black hat and a black coat. And we watched him. <laughs> he didn't see us. Mm -hmm. We watched him go by. <laughs> and we learned that our mothers would bargain with him for whatever it was, you know. So. After a while, we got to know who he was, but that was the first time, because we were growing up in Onondaga. We never, never went anywhere but running around in the woods there. And we never, we never played or on the road. We were always in the woods. That's where we were. We were swimming. We were out all day. We could feed ourselves out there. We knew what we could eat. We didn't have to go for lunch or nothing. We feed ourselves. The age groups run together, you know. We out there, fishing, swimming, running, playing. It was really nice. I didn't realize how, how lucky we were to be able to have that kind of a life. I didn't know that. Now, we didn't have much, you know. People were hungry a lot, all the time. But you could go next door and you could get a carrot or a couple of potatoes or something. Kids run next door. You got a potato? Yeah. You know they're going to make some kind of food somewhere. So, you know. so everybody shared everything. And so it had a community. You could go in and out of anybody's house and they'll take care of you. You know, what's your mother's name? How is she doing? You know, they, everybody knew everybody. So we had this big kind of a family run. 
It's nice. It's not like that now. Things have changed. So when I was asked to take a council position, I was already working in New York City as a commercial artist. I had established a business. I knew advertising. And uh, I was asked to come back and take leadership help. That's pretty hard. Actually, it, it was probably why I, our marriage didn't last, to that decision to go home. And uh, I did. So like I say, I've been learning. The first thing I had to do was pay attention before that security there at Underdog was always there. The chiefs were there, the clan mothers, everybody was. So you didn't worry about it because it was just there. But then when you began to take on that responsibility, then you go, whoa, this is a lot of work. It's a total commitment. And the traditional system was you don't receive any pay. There was no such thing 1,500 years ago. You had a duty and you had work, and that was what you did. And since we've kept that system, that's the way it is yet today. There is no payroll for our leaders. They take care of us. They do as best we can, but the things are different. But fundamentally, the rules, the laws are the same. And I think, from what I understand, that Six Nations is the last standing traditional government still in charge of land in North America now. Mm -hmm. Every other government, whether you're in Canada or the United States, has an elective system. Not where I come from. And we have the first treaty with the blossoming United States, 1775. When the Continental Congress requested a meeting with us in the new headquarters called Albany, New York. That's where Mohawk Fire was at one time, that camp there. And of course, we know their father. So they were going to get ready for a big fight. But we saw the fight. We've been working with them for 400 years. And uh, they asked us to join. And I'm going to make a point here, but it takes a little long. So I have to bear with me. And so at this time, they're getting ready to fight. And the Continental Congress, 62 members of the Continental Congress, asked the Six Nation Confederacy to come and sit with them. And we did. It's a long story to that. I won't go through that. But we had a meeting. And at that meeting, they told us about the problems they were facing. And we knew about that because we knew the leaders. We were in constant discussion with them, whether it was in Maryland or whether it was in Maine whether it was in Georgia, our leaders were there. So we knew, we knew what was happening, we were well aware. And there was a split in the, the Christian doctrine, the Catholics, and then you had the, the uh, Church of England, which was not Catholic. They had split. And that split carried over into the colonies. So we were aware of that as well. And it was coming to a head, and it was, 1775. So they asked us to join them. And our leader said, we know your father. We've been dealing with your father for a long time. We know you, and we think we think that this coming fight, which we know is coming because our minds are split like yours. 
we have people thinking this way and that way. We're making preparations. So it's well known that probably one of the worst thing you can do is step in between a family fight. <laughs> Anybody know you don't get your nose in there, otherwise they both turn on you. We say this is a family fight between you and your father. We don't think it's a good idea. And we had this discussion with your father just three months ago in Oswego. Same thing. And they said, good, because that was our second request. If you're not going to fight with us, don't fight against us. And we said, we will take that position, as we said to your father. We stand back in a neutral position. You settled this between yourselves, but you're in our land. There's no way. That. So at some point, you're going to see our men in the field on both sides. But when you see them there, remember that they're there as an individual. They're not representing their nation, nor are they representing the Confederacy. We're free people, and we can't tell people what to do. But you will see, and that's the way it was. And so, I move up to 1983. Uh, you had a president at that time. He was a Hollywood actor. Remember him? Yeah. And he was uh, re-energizing the draft. You remember the draft? And so, and that's what he did, you know. So all of a sudden, our young men were getting letters in the mail saying, you know, report to your draft. I said, we're going to do this. We said, well, bring them to us. Don't ignore it. Bring me here. We'll fill it out, and we'll send it down to them and say, you can't draft our men. And so this went on for a while. And then we got a call from the United States Selective Service System saying, can we have a meeting with you guys? And we said, yes, of course. Uh, what's the subject? This is, your men are refusing our, our draft. We said, oh, good. We'll have that discussion, please come up. So we set the time. We met with them Mother's Day, 1983. And they said, you set the time on Mother's Day. We said, every day is Mother's Day. <laughs> every day. So we had the meeting. And they said, we know what your position here is not new. We know that. But we don't know where, where's... Where is it? Where does it start? And we were ready. We had our men lined up. We had the wampum belts laid out. And we went back, 1744. And we told them we talked that discussion in 1744 when Six Nations was presiding, presiding over a, a meeting in Lancaster, Pennsylvania about land as usual, you know, the colonies and Six Nation was pre presiding. Because all the land was Indian land. And um, we were trying to protect the interests of our people, the nations, the land. So they were squabbling between themselves, the colonies. And one of the Onondaga chiefs stood up and he said to them, you know, you people never going to amount to anything until you learn how to work together. Why don't you make a union like ours? The principle of peace. That's the principle of our peace. Equity, to be fair to everybody, and to united. We're the first United Nations, Iroquois. 
way back, based on the woman side. The women are in charge of the clans. We have five leaders, clan mother, principal chief, deputy, faith keeper man, faith keeper female. That's our, in every clan, they have duties. Her duty is to find those leaders, choose those leaders. So it's the clan mother that chooses the leader. But it has to be ratified by consensus by the clan and then ratified by consensus by the council of chiefs and then finally ratified by consensus by the Six Nation Confederacy. So you just don't walk in there. And if you get chosen to be sitting there, you better think about your history because they're gonna know everything you ever did. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that. <laughs> but then I was like, oh, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but the nations cut you a lot of slack. Anyway, 1744, the Sundog chief said to them, you know, you're just not gonna, you gotta to work together. And in 1775, then, when we met the Speaker for the Continental Congress, said to us at that time, in 1744 in Lancaster, you advised us to make a union like yours. We are now taking your advice. That's where your United States started from. You don't know that. You haven't been told that. It's not in your history books. But it's in the history. It's in the congressional records of the United States. It's not a figment. It's written down word for word what they said. We're going to make a union like yours based on peace, equity. Union. And so I said I was going to make a point, and I come all the way around to that. <laughs> but you have to know the history in order to understand the point. And so you'll find that most Indian nations and speakers have this way of doing things. They have to take you from the beginning so that you can understand. You can't just tell somebody. You have to show the process. And it was a great experiment. Now, I would say, you know, you know what the first flag was for the Continental Congress? Anybody here know the first flag? It's a pine tree. It's a pine tree. And what is what is the symbol for the Haudenosaunee? It's a great white pine. Peace. And when they called us, 1775, they said, we want to rekindle our relationship under your great tree of peace. You don't know that. I'm telling you, that's your history. And we have treaties. After the Revolutionary War, and I won't go through that one, very hard fight. The first treaty that the new United States made was made in France, 18, 1783, and that was the peace between England and the colonies, now, now the United States. The second treaty that the new United States made was with the Haudenosaunee, 1784, because they had to. We were a force. We were a power. 1784. And we said, 
they said a lot of bad things happen, but let's forget that, and now we'll have a, a union. So we began that treaty. Another one, 1787, another one, 1789, 1790, 1794 treaties between nations. And they stand every year delivered to our nations, the Six Nations, from the United States treaty cloth every year. They know they hold that treaty. And in uh, 2016, they invited us to the White House and to the Renew the 1794 Treaty, Peace and Friendship. So treaties are real. You have a very powerful treaty here. And all the work that this man has done that's enormous work. That's your history. And where he started, seven, you know, 1823, going back, there's more history. And that starts with the Vatican. When the discovery of this land was made by a mercenary from Italy, carrying under the flag of Spain. When he landed, they, the year after, how is that? The year after he landed, the Vatican made a statement that they owned all the land, that this, the whole Continents, they own that all now. And our people, well, I mean, you guys were catching fish over here. We were hunting, nobody knew what they were saying. Made that declaration called the Doctrine of Discovery. It's just a, an announcement, we now own all this. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah? <laughs> and you know the history. It's been violent. But all that right there, it's amazing to me. I'm just uh, dumbfounded the work this man has done here. But back there, there's more work. And the Vatican is now contemplating rescinding that doctrine. But they don't all agree. Uh, I would say that they have a, a radical pope at this point. <laughs> He's, he wants to do what's right. I would also say that I think he's in physical danger for that position. It won't be the first pope assassinated by the so-called Holy See. Powerful group, long time. But anyway, there it is. And that brings us up to the contemporary times. So the discussion about peace and friendship, going back to those treaties that we have. Foundational to what we face in the future. Because this discussion and what we're looking out there now and what we're having the discussion is nature. Nature. We have affected the process of life in the world. We've affected it. And we don't have a wrench big enough to fix that. Ice is melting. Ice is melting fast faster and faster. And so I would say that we have to put aside, and I'm talking now about the human family, can't be 
Indians or black people or yellow people or white people. It's our family, the human beings. We're a family. We come in all colors. We come in all sizes. But we're still one family. And if we're going to survive as a species, that's the way you have to think. All aside, all of that aside, we now have to work together for all oh, that little that little guy that was dancing so hard. That's our responsibility. Look after him. And that's you know, the meeting that a friend over there put together. That's the discussion that's been going on for a long time. This has been going on, but now, as they say, it's time to fish or cut bait. That's it. You know, no second chances on this one. No second chances. We're in it now. We're in it. We're in climate change. It's going to go on, and it's going to get worse. And the only way we're going to survive as a species is to work together. Common cause. And remember the two laws, respect and share. If we follow those two laws, we've got a chance. We have a chance. But it's got to be that way. 1950. I was 20 years old, and there were three or 2.5 billion people in the world, all told, the whole world, 2.5 billion people. And here we are, like 68 years later, 7.6 billion people in the world within this last 68 years, almost triple the population, soon to be eight. Where's the water? Where's the food? Where's the land? Where's our relationship? We have responsibility to those people in Africa. We have responsibility to all those people. If you help them where they are, then they're not going to be moving. But water is the issue, and water is not adjudicated evenly around the world. So if you don't have water, you're going to go look for it. You know, we're pretty strong. We can go 70, 80 days without eating. We can starve a long time. <laughs> Try to go 10 days without water. Try to go four days. You're going to go. You're going to go look for water. That's what you're looking at right now today. You mentioned the River Jordan. The River Jordan is down to one-third of what it was before. It's mud today, right now. There's no water there. You have to have a bigger vision. You have to think global, because this is a global problem. A global problem requires a global solution. You can't fix one side and not the other, because no, <laughs> that's not the way nature works. Get all of us. So it's for our common good as a human species to try to survive this crisis that we we brought on. You can't go. And, you can't blame the trees. You can't blame the salmon. They didn't do that. It's us. You know there was a. You guys know about Pogo? You know, Pogo, pretty smart. He said one thing, and I always remember what he said. I was reading it. He says, I have seen the enemy, and it is us. Pogo. Truer words can be said. So, my message then here is, so thankful to see your dancers and your songs. 
Oh, that's a credit. That's a credit to your nation. Because that's where it is. That's the spiritual strength that you need there. That's where we have to go. This is a spiritual crisis. And it can only be a spiritual solution. So that's up to all of us here. Now, Tom and I have been in this for a long time. But we're not through. I don't know, sir. The last time I spoke to the UN, I went like this. I said, don't let this fool you. <laughs> no. Fight is on. Hard one. But we can do it. We can do it for this guy here. You can do it. You just got to share. And you just got to have respect. Those two can save the world. Donate. Really, really happy to uh, be sitting here with these elders I love and respect. I really want to thank you, Oren, for having a major influence on my life. Tom, Heiska. Uh, my Indian name is Sasi Ah. It means younger than Seattle. We come from one of the three chiefs, our three sisters of Chief Seattle. I'm proud to know that I'm Island Hokomelum, mainland Hokomelum, Strait Salish, and Osuchi. I'm from Nanaimo and Katsi and Simiama, Nooksack, Lummi, Jamestown, Kalalam, Skagit, Duwamish, Snoqualmie. These are all the way that we were brought together through our traditional marriage in the past. You know, uh, they arranged the marriages so that we'd have alliances uh, amongst our people. And I'm proud to know that I'm Seawan. I practice the Native American church, Peyote Church, Sweat Lodge. And I love to sing with the Shakers when I can. My mom was Catholic, and every time she put us in the, uh, for the teachings, as soon as she left, we ran out the back door and headed for the woods. You know, so that was, that was the place to be, and we'd sneak back into church, so we'll be there when she picked us up. But uh, born and raised on the Lummi Indian Reservation, had many opportunities to leave, but this is where I was raised. This is where my children and grandchildren will be raised. You know, the question on um, global warming is a, a big one. Song, dance, ceremony, oral tradition, traditional knowledge, traditional medicine, legend, myth, folklore, symbology, in our spirit societies, our traditional forms of government and our extended family systems have allowed us to keep our awareness of who we are alive. And we fought termination, extermination, genocide, relocation in Christianity and still survived. The United States by law and policy has sought to exterminate and eliminate our tribal awareness because they knew it connected us to the air, the water, and the land, the animals, the birds, everything. Our teachings taught us that we're the pitiful human beings. We're the last children of creation. And all things took a form on behalf, the direction of the Great Spirit. But when they transformed, they gave us something a gift, because we're so pitiful. We needed our older brothers and sisters to help us. And so the tree gives us something, the birds, the bees, the salmon, the clam, the crab, you name it, the bear, the wolf, the cougar, everything ha had power from the time of creation. And if we're 
really needing help, the Spirit was there for us to lift us up. And our longhouse people, from the longhouse of the Iroquois to the longhouse of the island Okamalem, and their teachings and sharing with us the straight sail each, we knew how to be lifted up through ceremony, song, dance, and spiritual teachings. We said it was schnup. The worst thing you could say about somebody at one time was they had no teachings. It was so horrible you would whisper it. But you're not even supposed to whisper it. That's how bad it was to say something like that about somebody. But through our extended families and our kinship, we have a little teachings here and there. And collectively, we have a lot. I was always happy to know that the elders that say that tree will sing to you. But you have to do something. You have to live that life. You have to fast. You have to control what you see, what you hear, what you say, what you eat, what you breathe, what you feel in your heart, what you think in your mind, and how you pray, and the work you do with your hands and where your feet bring you. The elders were strict at one time that if you were really dedicated to these ways, you would become a somebody. The Spirit would help you. And so that's still alive today. And it's a reflection of how much of the commitment to that is lost and how much damage the United States and their religion has done to us and their politics and society by the manifestation of 60 to 80 percent of our children are involved in high-risk behaviors, suffering from generational, transgenerational historical trauma and oppression, anomic depression. We've been attacked in every direction. The way we lived, the way we ate, the way we hunted, the way we fished, the way we worshiped, the way we spoke, everything was unacceptable. Our grandparents and great-grandparents were confronted with the outside telling us everything about you is unacceptable. You have to be like us. Walk like us, talk like us, worship like us, speak like us, think like us, work like us, live in houses like us, live in society like us, and make us your leaders. And so that's oppressive and oppressing to traditional peoples and traditional societies. You know, and if you become afraid to speak about your culture and your traditions and your beliefs, but at one time, we had so much knowledge, it created a cosmology. We had an awareness that all things are connected through our spirit, through its spirit. And if we're real pitiful, something out there would take care of you. You don't kill off everything. As it was said, we had ethics, we had values, we had teachings. We had organized government and society. The diseases killed many of us off, but we still survived. That's why Chief Seattle said at one time, we numbered more than the stars in the sky, but that time is no longer. He was a child whose parents survived smallpox. And it, these diseases came wave after wave, killing 90% of the people that were left each time. From the time of Cortez on, Village after village perished, robbed of your parents, your uncles, your aunts, your grandparents, time and time again. Waking up and the whole village is dead. Coming back from hunting and fishing, the whole village is gone. You have to unite, start over, find somebody to marry, to start your community over. You know, and all of our communities are full of these stories of survival, reorganization and regrouping, regathering, starting over, sharing what teachings were saved from every trial before us. You know, we brought Emoto over here. He's gone now, but he taught and shared with the world 
that what you think will go right to the water and the bodies of the other person. Anger, hatred, or love, or respect. He said, water wants to be respected more than it wants to be loved. And he showed a picture of the earth to water, and it formed the crystals of love. Water that flows over the earth, through the earth, on the earth, that comes from the sky, will have those crystals. Water that's impacted by humanity breaks down and has no form. We are the polluters, the destroyers. At one time it's been said, the sky is darkened with waterfowl, geese, and ducks. The water is full of salmon and halibut, bottom fish, crabs, oysters, shrimp, and cl clams. Wherever we looked in the northwest, there were plants in the water and up to the top of the mountain. We only worked three months out of the year. And we dedicated nine months to spiritual celebration and sharing. You're only a great person if you gave it all away. But you still had rules that limited your harvest. You couldn't take too much. There were Siams of the family, leaders in the community that made sure that you were taught not to destroy, not to take more than you need. Now they have recorded uh, songs of plants from the grass to the trees. Everything has a song, like our elders have said. Now they can record it. An uh, alder sings different from a maple. A maple sings different from a cedar. A cedar sings different from a fir. And they say that, they sing a song that says, I am sick, come and take me. And the uh, Bugs will come and take that plant out because it's sacrificing itself back to the earth. It's sick. In modern ways, we kill off the bugs and sell off the sick plants. But nature had its way. You know, and, uh, at one time we were taught that your first breath was sacred and your last breath is sacred. What you did in between with every breath is a measurement of what you're taught. It says how you lived your life. You know, I uh, always tell people that Columbus got here and he said, Una gente en Dios. One people in God. But he owed the queen. And if he left that on the record, then the Pope would know. And if the Pope knew, he had forbid the conquest of the Western Hemisphere because they're in Christian, in God people. So we had to take Indios in God and create Indios. And we became Indians. And we've lived the lie ever since. I call it the first corporate lie. And it began the authorization of plundering and raping the environment and destroying the indigenous peoples that were connected to it. And that's significant. Now you see corporations under United Citizens. Corporations are citizens too. Corporations are people, too. And so they can line the pockets of politicians and undermine all regulations and laws that protect the environment for your children and great-grandchildren. I'm sorry to say the Republican Party is the worst thing on the earth today for what they're standing for. They're sacrificing the future of the vision the Iroquois shared and help create, known as popular sovereignty, we the people of the United States, we the people of the state, we the members of the Lummi Nation. It's all a part of what was taught in the beginning, that we hold our leaders accountable. They're disconnected from reality. You know, and I'm proud that we've been able to unite Churches, here's our colleagues right here, environmental groups, citizens groups, tribes, and stopped all six coal port proposals that were planned for the West Coast. United, united we stood. That's what the Iroquois Confederacy was about, united. We had an alliance before Vancouver came here. 
with the Hulkamalums and the straight Salish, our relatives. We had to unite against our northern enemies about 1692. That's what was called the Point Elliot Treaty, the alliance of the Duwamish and Suquamish. We knew who we were. But now you look around and the streams are full of silt. Just in the Lummi area alone, 100,000 truckloads of silt have flown out of the Clear Cut Mountains and filled Bellingham Bay. In my grandfather's time, that, that drop-off was just below Marietta itself. That was the drop-off, deep water. That little bank above Marietta used to have the waves crashing over it, covering, going over the tr cars that went by it. In our lifetime, Bellingham Bay has been filled. We buy water from Lake Whatcom that everybody else has dumped their sewage into. 13 cases of E. coli every year. Fukushima is on our shores within one year. The tribes of the plains had to live the reality of no longer are there any buffalo. That should have been a warning. We should be planning for the day after salmon and seafood. Of course the United States won't recognize Fukushima because it means the major collapse of all fishing economies around the Pacific Ocean. Unless you want to use a gagger counter at your food table to test everything that comes out of the water, Hanford is uh, leaking more and more radiation every day. We send all of our garbage to kick a cat. It's all washing the wet runoff is a stream of poisons entering into the Columbia. I was talking to a group that says, you know the difference between this energy, this is male, they say, is a female energy. And they're saying that now you could take the garbage of the most polluted water or cement and break it down into its molecules and create energy with no carbon imprint. We got solar panels being opposed. We're the worst example. I used to always tell people, the United States are, is the pig of the world. We consume more, we want more, we use it faster and waste more than anybody else in the world. And we think that our lives is the role model for all others. It's not. You know, I was, I'm happy to know that in 2015, the Vatican issued a statement, an encyclical Laudato Si. Basically, the Pope was saying, we taught you that God created all things and gave you dominion over the world. What we should have taught you is that God created all things. All things are sacred. Have respect for God's creation. Now it's too late. We may be too late. We need to uh, find ways to undo the damage. Every church should start every sermon with those words. God created all things. All things are sacred. Report, respect God's creation. Just that handed down to the children from now on. But we live in a global society led by the United States that has no respect for the public trust. They don't care. They don't want to leave anything for their grandchildren or great-grandchildren, except for a world destroyed and polluted. The public trust doctrine has been around 1,500 years, and it's been oppressed and shoved away because it means you have to stop, leave some for the future generations. And that's what our teachings were about. That's why the sky was so full of waterfowl and the rivers and streams and lakes were full of fish. Leave some for the future generations. Don't take too much. Now the deer and the elk and the wolf and the bear, the otter, you name it, are extinct are going extinct. 
In our life daily, another thing has disappeared. We have to believe that our elders gave us something. They gave us teachings. They shared with us. They're the role models. You know, I know um, for the last 18 years, we gave away totem pole after totem pole after totem pole. It's because if the Spirit gives you a gift, you have to share it or it can be taken away from you. And we, you know, myself and House of Tears Carvers, we must have given Lummi Nation 70 pieces of totem art. There's another 50 out there that we gave throughout all across the nation and up into Canada. You know, because it's the symbols, it's the stories, the legends, the myths, the teachings, that we have a relationship with the world around us. That's not just a bear or an eagle or a hawk. That's a symbol. Awaken. Because all races, red, black, white, and yellow at one time were connected with the earth. When you're in the womb, you heard your mother's heartbeat. But somehow, as a society, we can't remember it even if we all got together as the American creed. But as Indian people, we have our drums and regalia, our rattles, our voices. We hear those songs. We hear that heartbeat. We're Mother Earth people. Mother Earth spirituality is still alive with us. It's still a part of our advice. We're not empty, and it's because of the strength of the inner tribal teachings and the willingness to share. But how do you awaken a whole national society when even their religion advocates domination, when their politics are enriched by exploitation and guarantees another term in office? I was, um, we gave a poll to Beaver Lake Cree because tar sands. I met this young lady and her sister was thrown off the 33rd floor because she was an activist against the tar sands. And she was crying and she made uh, Chief Dan George's daughter cry, an elder. We heard that mother, that grandmother crying. And so we brought a totem pole to Beaver Lake Cree to tell them, we hear you, we stand with you, we unite in your campaign. We want you to know that we believe in your traditions and your knowledge. That was our goal. You know, when they say that if you keep sacrificing and willingly giving, the Spirit will have pity on you. You know, and, uh, the day before we were ready to leave, the ancestors came. And they said, sing that song for us. And they sat me down in a dream. And I said, what song? And they said, you know the song. And I woke up singing that song. You know, and uh, before that, in the 90s, a whale came to Lummi. And we tried to save her, a minky whale. And we prayed to be one mind, one spirit, to be able to lift that whale and move her into deep water. But time and tide were against her. We only could move her 20 feet. Even with the federal, state, and tribal enforcement threatening to prosecute us, we wanted the water to save that sister. She was crying. People were crying after she died because they heard her death song. She gave us a song. We sang that song up in Canada and, and in two-thirds of the United States also. All things have a song. We're just so insensitive we can't hear them anymore. We can't feel 
the world around us. We become indoctrinated. You know, I like the teachings of um, Dr. Gregory Kahiti in Native Science. He tried to ex explain that relationship. That this is a way of living with the world. It's a way of managing your relationships. This is a way of believing that your actions can be accountable and controllable through traditional teachings from one generation to the next. All of our stories are full of legends and, or, uh, or um, teachings of sacrifice and control. You sacrifice and control your behaviors and your beliefs. And in the end, the spirit will be generous with you. That song the elder said, uh, I want to sing just one verse, if I may. And it's simple. But I feel like because we gave all these totem poles, see, the spirit gave me that to share, you know, it's a manifestation of belief. And this is repeated over and over again all across the Indian country. It's just that we, our culture and our spirituality have been attacked so much, we don't like to talk about it. The oppressors are listening. When my great-grandparents on my mother's side and great-grandparents on my uh, Father side, they're both the Owen. They practice in the woods. But they sent runners over to watch, make sure the farmer in charge was asleep. They couldn't bring out the drums. They had to use sticks to keep practicing because it was the days of the Indian Religious Crimes Code. And you went right to prison. No trial, no jury, no rights, no lawyers straight to prison. And the BIA said, if your family died while you're in prison, it's your own fault, because you're a heathen. You chose to do that. <clears throat> that happened to all the reserves. I was just talking to a, one of the ladies that works here. She's from Aleut. And she was reciting the damages done to her grandparents and great-grandparents to her generation, the oppression, the beatings, how they'd watch their people almost beat to death, still in her lifetime, for being who they are. It's not over. The pain is still here. And I think the native indigenous experience is a reflection Felix Cohen said, like the Mariner's Canary, the American Indian marks a shift from fresh air to poison gas in our political atmosphere. Our treatment of the Indian, even more than our treatment of other minorities, marks the rise and fall in our democratic faith. He had just studied all the laws of the United States that applied to Indian country, the schizophrenia, and he had an awakening. And that's what Oren's talking about. Orrin's been busy in the United Nations all his life, and his elders before him. Woodrow Wilson modeled the League of Nations on the Iroquois Confederacy. That was the role model for the United, uh, United Nations. I was proud to go there and find Orrin at the United Nations debating the, and helping draft and argue for the United Nations Declaration of Rights Indigenous Peoples. And all aspects of our tribal existence as society are included in that declaration. We want to heal in all these areas you attacked and destroyed. These are inherent rights you have denied and oppressed. You have silenced our voice. We're down in Earth Summit. Couldn't even participate in Earth Summit. We had to go to Global Forum. No indigenous voices at Global Forum. Just nation, modern nation states, the conquerors, the exploiters, patting each other on the back and telling each other what a good job they're doing. But we know it's not true. <clears throat> we 
That's uh, the verse. The elders said, sing that song. The elders on that side, the ancestors, they always talk to us. They advise us through dreams. You know, and, uh, I know that I've had a vision in 78, a real vision. I know I had near-death experiences. I know I see things past, present, and future through dreams. I don't know what goes on for you. I just know that the teachings of the elders is that I'm tied into it, and there's no way around it. And I really believe I dedicate myself to the protection of our people because of those dreams, those visions. I'm here for a reason. And I love our ancestors because they whispered in the ears of our elders who teach the children, like that little boy dancing, dancing to the heartbeat of Mother Earth. He was dancing to her heartbeat. That's what it's about. And until we know that, until you can hear your mother's heartbeat, you can't hear the heartbeat of the Earth. It's all about the conquest. 17 father son god religions created in the last 5,000 years. 17 male-oriented religions in oppression to the Mother Earth teachings. They all lived the same life, all had the same teachings, all became the same example. We'd call them collectively avatars, not saying that they're not right, not saying that they were wrong. It's just that they have a teaching. You go back in the Hebrew, Teachings. You go back to early Christianity, and they said they had a seed in you. You have a seed, a seed, a little tiny seed inside you. And one day it blossoms, boom. Something happens, and you absolutely believe in the spirituality in God. There's something greater than you, and it blossomed, and nobody can tell you otherwise. You'll never stop believing. And that's what it is in Indian country. In all those trials, we follow that path, trying to awaken our spirit. But if we don't, then we just remain pitiful, and our days are numbered, and we perish. But there's enough. There's enough hearing the collective voice that's being handed down by the elders to keep it alive, but if we don't become more active in the sharing and the teaching and the calling for changes in society, then we accept the destruction of the world. It's poison and the pain that's going to leave our kids. I lost two kids, and I carve holes for their memory. I'm dedicated to it in their memory. And they came back to me. 
after that. I know the spirit is real. Absolutely real. I'm fortunate as a parent to have undergone that. Not everybody gets that. I only share it because our elders taught that our ancestors are with us. They fill all of these empty spaces. They love us on that side, but love's different. But they still watch over us. That's why we have to walk the talk. That's why we have to pass the teachings on. We're being observed. They're implanted in our minds and our hearts. And we're being tested. If we don't unite and get the voice out there, then we're witnessing the downfall of the American dream. And I'm proud of the American dream to the point that the Iroquois shared a sacred vision with the United States. And they became a role model for 167 other constitutional popular sovereignty nations in the world. Just as the vision said, it will go to the east, the west, the north, and the south, the red, the black, the white, and the yellow. They told the United States it's going to go in the four directions. And it did. The hope for humanity is through holding government accountable because we empowered them. We have a mind, a body, and a soul. And if we treat ourselves right and practice the teachings, then we become a sovereign person. And through our collective sovereignty, we charge our leaders with responsibility. So, I just pray that uh, somehow, some way, somewhere, with someone, we can create a bigger voice. We, you're losing. You're losing. They're deregulating. They're poisoning the rivers, the lakes, and the streams. You know, in Christianity, you say the devil's on his way. I think he arrived with his power signs. He's neo-Nazis, always sending the message out. It's all about profit, rape, and murder. Not only of the world, but children. The original res uh, concentration camps are reservations. Then it was the Japanese. And now it's the little children of Mexico. You can see the pictures. That's who we become. It has to be us. We're responsible. We're letting the handcuffs go on babies. It's a diversion also. Because we don't know how powerful our voice could be. We're just seeing more and more police power being exercised. Like the brown bands of Hitler. It's spreading. I think we better look at Mein Kampf and start comparing. It's on your doorstep. We have to awaken that we are better than that. You know, it's not just society, but the environment. Now they're arresting anybody that starts protesting. That's, that's Gestapo. There's no more freedom of the press. They don't want your voice getting out, so they limit Facebook and any other text mess system you might thought you were reaching out with. There's hope for all of our grandchildren. We don't despair. It's hard. It's hard not to. But we should take that and use it to energize us, ourselves, to drive us harder. 
Man, I was surprised when I found out there's a granny organization that will go chain themselves to a railroad tracks and lay down in front of trains and trucks. You know, we don't talk about them enough. But I'm proud to hear from Warren that the uh, traditional elders have gathered. He helped get me to some of those meetings. It's good to know that the story is still being told. The teachings are still being recited. But we don't know how to cross over and teach and share fast enough. You know, they say the sacred hoop was broken. It can't. You can't break the spirit. You can't break God. You're not that big. It's just that you forgot. But it's still red, black, white, and yellow. All four races are still a part of humanity. You still have teachings. It's just that when you see the natives here doing it, or the natives of Maori or Australia or Africa, it awakens something. There's something bigger, older than Christianity, something greater in the teachings about this oneness of life. That's what the whale sing song it came to us it was about eight swallowing. It's that oneness, one song, one people, one place, one spirit, one power. That's oneness with everything. That's what the whale brought to us when she died on our beach, telling us to remember the oneness of life. And that's the song that House of Tears has sung every place we went. We're trying to awaken. Uh, our elders say you never know when somebody's going to be listening, especially children. You tell that child right there, and you never know who he's going to become. He may be the one. I was down in Australia. I was sent there by the late Larry Kinley to work with the aborigines of Kohanyama. And they were oppressed, and they were afraid. They wanted native voices to come there and say, don't be afraid to exercise your sovereignty. Believe in yourself. They, just, they knew that. They knew it. They just wanted others to come there and tell them, don't be afraid. Be who you are. Believe in yourself. They went from a village to owning nearly 4 million acres today since the mid-'80s. They're buying back their territory. They're taking it back. They put on badges and uniforms and walked through and told people to leave their territory. They acted with authority, even though nobody in the white government gave them that authority. They gave it to themselves and said, you have to leave. You have no right to kill these crocodiles or these wallabies. Went there and we gave a speech. I was talking to these little children. They said, we want you to talk to our children. Uh, oh, my God, how am I, when am I going to talk to little four- and five-year-olds? I brought my flute. I brought some art. And I was talking to the children the way I heard, saying that you could be the one. And this little girl was in the audience. And a few years ago, I got a knock on my door. There was this aboriginal woman standing there. And she asked if I remembered her. I go, I'm sorry, no. I don't. She goes, well, because I was only four going on five when you talked to me. You pointed at me, said, I could be the one. You said, I could be the one. I could be the one to get my education, to get a BA and the master's and be the example of other Aborigine girls. And I believed you. And I did it. I'm Miss Aborigine of Queensland. I go to other little girls and teach them, you are the one. You are the one. And I come here to say thank you because I believed you. And that's what the elders say. You talk to them like that. But we have to talk to each other like that because we have our doubts. You have your doubts that you're right. But we know right from wrong in our minds and our heart. And the government knows too. There's something corrupting government. And that's where power of the people today means more than anything ever in our history. Thomas Jefferson said, 
Every now and then you need a revolution. That's your founding father. So thank you for letting me go on. Heiska. Sure. I'm pleased to represent the female aspect of this conversation. <laughs> Mother Earth is in me, and uh, I'm a nurturer. I uh, don't come from the Lummi Nation, but I live here. I was born in Seattle and, and share the Earth of Coast Salish nations and people, so I'm grateful to share this land with you and, uh, and for your teachings from the East. And I, um, to clarify the uh, introduction, my name's Jill McIntyre-Witt, because I did get married, but Jill Witt sounds like a dessert topping, so I don't go by that, <laughs> so for the record. As far as my ancestors go, uh, 30 years ago I was married and learned that I'm part Filipina because I think my mother's side of the family was ashamed about uh, the Filipino man that got my grandmother pregnant, or great-grandmother pregnant, so uh, I carry that with me and uh, am proud of, of that piece of, piece of me and not ashamed for my skin color. And I have been involved with climate justice work for some time. I was fortunate to live in four different countries and learn from various peoples from around the world, uh, first in Australia with the Aboriginal culture and spending some time on the Great Barrier Reef. And the amount of respect I felt for the reef and the teachings I learned about the reef, I felt like everybody needed to know about the Great Barrier Reef because of its fragile ecosystem and how we're all in this together, plants, animals, humans, as part of that. So I made a collection of algae for the my university is herbarium to help people learn about the reef, and I had no idea of what was going to happen in my lifetime that that would matter and that those plants in my lifetime would suffer and the animals there. It makes it hard to speak because so much has happened in my lifetime. And I've done a lot of work with indigenous communities and the voices from them, I hear is, oh, we, we have the answers if only they'll listen to us. And hearing you share your stories brings me to a place of realizing that right now we have that common struggle with the climate crisis <laughs> and how we, at this point in time, need to weave this and create this story together, collectively, in unity. And it will be our greatest greatest achievement if we're fortunate to have it written in the history books. That's what keeps me going is to think about the young children, the seventh generation out that will be reading about us because it's our time as Jay was mentioning about we're the last generation, the people alive today to decide whether or not humanity survives. And I look forward to being a part of that with all of you and sharing this time and space to know that it will be those children wondering what was it that brought them together and allowed for them to unify and allow us to survive. And I think the indigenous wisdom and knowledge and tradition and stories passed down, if they could be shared and heard and respected and believed and carried on with everybody, because we're all one. I think we can get there. That's what gives me hope.
I wake up every day and cry, as do probably most people, maybe in this room or on this planet. And I am grateful and thankful for the time I spent with the Lemme Youth Canoe family in Paris because I got to witness people from the Sardiaku dance with the Lemmy, the songs and the dance they did together. And you've witnessed it, I imagine, in your travels. And four years ago, we had 195 nations agree that we needed to tackle climate change. And in these last four years, we've only seen an increase in emissions, which is not the direction we're supposed to be going. So we share that right now in this space and time that we're going in the opposite direction. So for the young people, my message is simple, and that is join the other young people that are in this movement. We have Greta Thunberg from Sweden who is wakening the whole world to not just climate change, but the climate crisis, the climate emergency, and shifting that narrative to help people understand the urgency and how there isn't much time. She strikes every Friday because what she's learning in school isn't what's going to keep us surviving. So she says, why do I need to be in school? And September 20th, there's a global climate strike for climate activism all around the world for everybody to join the youth. So I want to put that out there in hopes that people will join that in their communities, wherever they are. What form will that take? Whatever form any community wants it to take, it's global. It's a great question, though, what form will that take? And it reminds me of what you said about the corporations running our governments. And I always spoke about how our vote is like, our dollar is like a vote, and how we spend our money is like a vote. And I've I'm, I'm been thinking lately about how maybe as a society around the world, maybe every Friday, while Greta is having everybody strike, that we strike by not spending our dollars, our money. Imagine if the global economy stopped every Friday, and that would be about a 17, 16, 17 percent reduction of commerce. Now that would get their attention. Did that get their attention? <laughs> right? <laughs> I think big things. <laughs> I am fasting every Friday to join Greta, but that's a personal choice, and I know not everybody can do that. But if everybody did that, imagine our food system feeling that. That might be a, a gentle thing to do for Mother Nature, because the way we consume on the earth and the way we grow food and the food waste, imagine if every Friday we just took a break from that, how Mother Earth would hear our prayer. Um, so I agree about governments being ran by corporations, and I'm ashamed of what's happening in Canada, and it's happening here. I do still believe that if our leadership isn't working, we just change it out. And we're seeing that with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez another young person doing amazing work. That gives me hope. Our elections come hopefully soon enough that change can emerge. Uh, I, I'm a pathological optimist, so I find the good in the Cheeto. <laughs> that was bad, sorry. I'm not a name caller. <laughs> um, but uh, our current US government is waking people up to the injustices in our society and institutional racism and the systemic change that we need to see and and be a part of and uh jewel 
What did you say about the detention camps at the border as a distraction or a hmm? a diversion? Right. Uh, yes, this is true, and I think we have to remember that there are a lot of distractions keeping us from addressing the climate crisis. And I think that's where climate justice comes in because social, racial, economic, and environmental justice is climate justice. And wherever your heart takes you, uh, do the work because we're all born at this time. I share this space and time with you and the other seven billion plus people, and I feel like it's up to all of us to, to do the work, because we have no other choice. And, and you give me great teachings today to carry on the work. I know it's for life, so it's not like we can burn out. Burnout's not an option. <laughs> so if you're feeling burnout, then figure that out, because get a good night's sleep and wake up as, e as if each day is your last. That's what I do, and uh, I'm very thankful to the Lummi Nation for really working tirelessly to have your treaty rights honored and respected to stop the coal port, and I owe you a debt of gratitude. So your, uh, your work on that and trusting your neighbors in Bellingham to join the fight with you and work together was, I think, a role model for the rest of the world on working with our uh, non-native neighbors to work on solving big issues. So if you are a non-native and wherever you are in the world, I ask that you be an ally for your native neighbors because They'll need their backs covered when their frontline communities are at risk. And with our institutional racism in our prison system, we are treated differently because of being white than people of color, as you all well know. So we need to stand up and, and uh, help where that's needed just like we saw the veterans when they came out and helped in Standing Rock. So I'm not gonna be long-winded, <laughs> but they're not long-winded. I just don't have very many teachings to offer except to share my respect and the space with you, so thank you. Thank you yeah. Real quick, if we can give them a round of applause. I can't help but notice our, our, how well behaved and patient and attentive our, our youth are here today. Um, really, really thankful for them. Uh, thank you to our, our speakers for your, your words of wisdom, uh, of uh, peace and equity, uh, unity uh, to respect and to share. Uh, all of the historical knowledge, um, your ideas for the future and especially uh, hope. Um, and and I've, act I've watched a lot of Oren Lyon's videos, as I'm sure uh, many of you have, and I heard him say that you know, it's, it's a responsibility of our leadership to never take away hope from the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, seeing them today and seeing our youth here listening to that uh, brings all of us hope. And, and uh, I'm really looking forward to all of us working together um, on the next steps. And so uh, I also want to apologize. Uh, when I first uh, had spoke, I said that we'd open it up for questions after that, but we've, we've actually ran out of time. Um, so uh, I guess with that, just another round of applause for the speakers and our youth that are here. And I think that's, that's it. Heishka, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Oh, can I get a picture of you? Uh, sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you. Deb Brownfield, Unitarian Universalist. You were the one who wrote the letter for our repudiation of the Doctrine of Discovery back in 2015. I met you here in the smokehouse and I sent you a letter home. You called me and you helped make that happen. So I I mean, Link God? Yeah. TJ. Okay. I learned a lot today about that. Thank you very much. See you sitting right there. Yeah, I was really good. I just finally feel a little bit. Yeah. Jesus, I have fun with some of them. Yeah. So good to see you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Good. You're doing good work. Thank one you. day at a time. We're in this together. <laughs> yeah, one day at a time. Tony. I live yeah. every day as if it's my last. I learned that from one of my mentors. Yeah, that's what I look at, one day at a time. Yeah. I try to do more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Sure you're familiar. You did okay, yeah. Oh. Yeah. They have yeah, no, uh, Lummi Nation. I just, or uh, Lummi Nation. I just wanted to thank you in the sense of uh, 30 plus years that you've influenced our relatives. In the sense, of, uh, we have a spoken we call it in language, uh, which was our our um, finances in. Uh, before contact, uh, and that, uh, something came from nature. Uh, something was done by the hands of, uh, of the people, and then that was part of what you're saying. Your law is, is that we share. So on behalf of the Lummi Nation, I thank you for uh, this uh, woven blanket and uh, it, uh, a symbol for uh, keeping you warm and a, and a uh, sense of thank you as well. Uh, we also wanted to thank uh, Jewel with that uh, youth called uh, the Wolf. Um, oh, I Wolf. Yeah, uh, good. For, uh, good. That's a good idea. For bringing that memory uh, yeah. in terms of the sovereignty, that mindset, and that foul, we call it foul, uh, which is a belief uh, in our our ancestral ways. Uh, and the only way we can do that sometimes is yeah. through our language. Yeah. and. Uh, the language wakes up the spirit, and we wanted to thank Jewel uh, as well. So um. good, that's good. Well, I want to uh, thank you for that, and to express to the Lummi Nation that I appreciate your support and the fact you're still doing what you're doing here. I really appreciate that. It gives me a lot of. Uh, Strength when I see the dancers in the song. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys. Uh, yeah. So I want to thank, thank you. you. Uh, also, we have one of the youth that done a uh, print. Ooh, nice. uh, so that came from one of the uh, third graders, I believe. So. Very good. Thank uh, you. And uh, Jewel, if you can come over for just a second, I know that people want to talk to you guys. But uh, <laughs> earlier on, you you expressed that. Uh, Warren had uh, given you the construct for sovereignty and cultural sovereignty and that uh, uh, the elder that he had brought uh, uh, to uh, you and to bring that message to you and that you carried that out for these decades. Uh, so we gave him this uh, book, uh woven and then also uh, we called something other the wolf, so we also want to cover you in a sense for that memory. Uh, because it's in the upcoming generation that, uh, that these younger ones that we uh, wanted to talk, uh, the, uh, the young women that we had uh, here, um, they were on time for some reason or other, so they weren't able to actually cover you. So uh, because of our modern process, we put uh, media before culture sometimes, and politics before cult culture, and, uh, but uh, we always have to remember that we're a patient people and we have to respect that. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, regardless, and, uh, and it, if it were, uh, you know, I, they said young people, I turn around and, oh, there's one. 
That's right. <laughs> I turned around and I thought, oh, yeah, no, those yeah, are yeah. nothing but old people back there. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay, too. Uh, then we also just want to thank um, our relative Jay. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, our uh, relative Love Jay, and you're doing uh, good. And T um, Salak, T Salak. Want to thank you for your uh, participation today, and thank you with a blanket, uh, with a as a handshake, Siam and uh, Slay Halton. Um, Want to thank you and. Uh, Jill, who ran away. Oh, she had to go, I won't say. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, on behalf of Lummi, thanking you for uh, your participation and sharing your, your uh, experiences uh, that bring uh, something from the past and something for the future. So, hi, Stacey. Yeah. I'm thanking you. Here she comes, right here. Yeah, say something. Right here. Here's Jill. Oh, here's Jill. I'm not starting over, but thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right. Right. We'll yeah. mail this stuff to your office. Yeah. Wow. Okay? Mm -hmm. Can we get a picture? Okay, but this is just the beginning now. You, yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll you opened up a good door. Well, you're yeah, we're after a now we're yeah. good. It's a war plan. One yep. picture really quick. One picture. <clears throat> Come on. <coughs> Should we go? Should I be on the end where I was? No, you're good right around? where you are. Okay, yep. thank you. Trees. 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 Trees.